Hi, it's Ken again. Hopefully you've been through the three previous sections and we know now what's inside of motors and we know more importantly the parameters that are associated with motors in terms of RPM and torque and horsepower and all of that. But today we're going to talk about where the real important aspects are. In other words, you know the stuff about motors but how are you going to design around them? So the first step in designing around any motor is to figure out exactly how much power do you need. This should be obvious, but it's surprising the amount of times I've seen people just pick a motor because it's the right size or it looks right and without really analyzing the power requirements. So you select a motor principally on the power requirements and then there's a whole hierarchy of, of uh, steps I'd recommend you go through if you have motors which are similarly powered. Next thing would be to figure out what's the total weight of this motor with the transmission required to get the desired RPM and torque. Uh, this can be very important in some applications where you have a motor at the very long end of an arm or, or down low where it can be heavy. Uh, once you got that part figured out, then you can go through and say uh, some applications there's a physical size requirement. In other words, the motor itself has to be quite small. Uh, if it's going to be in some sort of a, of a wrist at the end of, a, of an arm, it must be quite small. After going through those criteria, you go down to the next uh, level of hierarchy and that to me would be um, what are the back drive characteristics? In other words, how resistant is the motor to being driven backwards? Uh, this can be a critical thing we'll talk about later on if you're having something which is a, a lifter or something that, that has to hold away for some time. And finally, you get through some of the minor criteria. Uh, those include things like is it going to be under continuous high load, just intermittent high load. Um, is it, if you have everything else the same, you would always pick the motor which is more efficient because very seldom do you really want to drain your batteries or energy source faster than you, you need to. And finally, the last criteria, which often happens if you're running with some constrained design problem is what motors do you have left? You've used the best ones for where they need to go. You have a tertiary or secondary apparatus and you, you'd use whatever you have left. So having said these things, let me give you some, some, some very general specific um, examples. First off, again, you'll see a lot of these motors. These are very heavy. They're non-air cooled. They're, they, they rely upon a lot of thermal mass to absorb um, excess thermal energy. These are by nature heavy and they're also by nature robust. So if you're going to use these, use them under high power requirements but also very low on the chassis. Uh, typically these would be used for drive lines on robots or very high powered arms or that sort. You can get similar power, of course, with um, air-cooled motors, but these are only happy if they're running very high RPM. And that's because the fan only works at high RPM. So use these for things like shooters, things where the motor is going high speed until it gets loaded, a fan, something like that. Be very careful about using these when it's at very low RPM. They would have a big problem with it. A third type of motor is ones with integral transmissions. Now motors like this, and this one for example has a worm gear on, this is the Van Door motor. One of the nice things about these is that since this particular motor was designed for automotive use, it actually has thermal protection inside of it. So it has a graceful degradation if it is overloaded. That's good news is that the motor will not burn itself up. The bad news is that when it degrades like that it also loses a lot of torque. And you'll find that out if you use these too much. So let's go on right with an example. So I have a robot, let's say, that weighs 100 pounds and I need to lift it 3 feet, or excuse me, uh, yes, 3 feet and 10 seconds. We want to see how much power is required. So this is a straight physics problem. If you look at that, and remembering that mechanical power is the rate at which you do work. And so in this case, we're talking about a 100 pound robot, 3 feet, that's 300 foot pounds of work, in 10 seconds. And so if you went to your motor catalog and say, hey, I need a, uh, what's that work out to be, about a 30 pound feet per second motor, you would find that kind of hard to find because no one rates power that way, although that it truly is a power. But if you multiply that by a conversion factor, which I just happen to know, a unity conversion factor for power is 746 watts equals 550 foot pounds per second, one horsepower. If you multiply that, you'd find that that, uh, that requirement is 40 watts. So we need 40 watts net mechanical power to raise this robot. Now if you were to look at the, for example, the 2014 FRC allowed motors, you would find that 12 of the 20 different styles of motors which are allowed would have at least that 40 watts. And so now it comes time to figure out, well, which one do you use? Well, you have power, 12 of them, but you'd find out that a lot of them that are very high powered would be already taken for other higher powered um, devices on the motor, on their, your drive line, for example.
And so a reasonable motor to pick would be one of these Van Dorn motors. In fact, it's, it's reasonable because we also talked about this earlier, and so we can use the performance data we've already established for that. This one, if you recall, does put out a peak of 50 watts. So we've decided to use this motor. Now, if you look at this curve, you will see that, the, that as in all DC motors, 40 watts, which is sub-maximum of this motor, which is 50 watts max, is available at two different operating points. Just as a reminder, one point is going to be at high RPM and low torque. The other point on the right side is going to be at high torque and low RPM. Either of those parts on that inverted parabola will give you the same power, but one is more efficient than the other. And let's just remind ourselves on that, why that is. If I were to go to the left side of the curve, the high speed, low torque, I would find that the motor is about 45% efficient. 45% of the electrical power coming into this actually becomes mechanical power. On the other hand, if I was to do the other side, the right side of the curve, I would find that the efficiency drops to about 18%. So we would like the motor to run at the high efficiency. In this case, we have a fairly low RPM output. And so it's conceivable not to have to use a conventional transmission to do what we want to, but just make a, a drum that can provide us with the, the pulling power of a winch. And so if you look at this, uh, we would like to make this motor operate not on the right side, the high torque, but the low torque side, which means we have to make sure that the torque on this motor does not go over 100 inch pounds, because that's where it is at 40 watts on the left side. So simply all we have to do is design a drum which would when it lifts 100 pounds, would also require 100 inch pounds of torque. That's pretty simple. It simply means the radius must be one inch. So if we were to design a two inch diameter drum on this thing, pulling a cable, then 100 pounds of lifting would exactly equal 100 inch pounds of torque. And that would be good. So that's pretty simple. And that forces this motor to operate where we want it to operate. Okay, so that's, that's how you drive it. You, you do the analysis, make sure that you are demanding the proper torque, and then the motor will behave like you expect it to. Now, there's a couple details we need to talk about which are often forgotten about, um, about mechanisms which actually have to hold a force, for example, lifting yourself up off the ground or holding some weight off the ground. And that is that even when this motor is not moving, if it has to hold constant torque, it's going to absorb uh, current, which causes it to overheat. Now, in this example, let's say that we did design the one inch radius winch drum. If we were to hold ourselves and stop the motor, you would find out it's going to take about 30 watts of electrical power just to hold it in position. No mechanical power because we're not moving, but it would take 30 watts just to hold it. So it's important when you design a motor like that to divide some, make some sort of a device which takes the load off of the motor when it's not being moved. And that can be done with a ratchet, uh, a one-way clutch, but you really don't want to have to have a motor continually hold forces on it or torques in it because it does overheat. You know, this has been, uh, and I want to reiterate, the most important thing is that you cannot ever decide what motor to use without initially figuring how much power you need to have. Once you've done that, then you need to operate motors always on the left side. The left side is the high RPM, low torque side of the performance curve. And if you have an air-cooled motor, like this, you're trying to do that, that they can only operate just for a few seconds at that very high right side. Um, because over a few seconds, they overheat and actually um, burn up and not be able to use it again. People sometimes try to think that you can control the performance of the motor or speed of the motor or the output only by controlling voltage. Be very, very careful about that. A well-designed motor application, when it's doing what it's supposed to do, should be operating at full voltage. If you have to reduce the voltage, you're making the motor work a lot harder. It turns out that, that when you reduce the voltage in half, you, you reduce the maximum power by one quarter. So this was an awful lot to talk about in terms of how, to, how motors work, uh, how they perform, and how to design around them. The simplification today was that I used a motor which didn't require any significant output change on the backside. In other words, I didn't have to have a fancy transmission. This, this one just put drum on there. The next step, if you have a motor, and the next thing we should talk about at some point, is how transmissions work and how to modify that motor now to make it do all the things you want it to do.